Um, so then uh, let's get started. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the April uh, College of Fine Arts Town Hall. Excuse me. My name is Julie Johnson. I am the Director of Student Success Initiatives, and I would like to welcome Dr. Ashley Stone, who will be taking care of all of our technological issues today. If you have any questions, please feel free to enter them into the chat and Dr. Stone will handle it from there. Uh, I would like to turn everything over now to our Dean, Dr. Nancy Usher, who will be handling things from here. Dean Usher, it's all you. Well, thank you so much. I want to thank uh, Dr. Brian Labus, who's here with us today. I want to thank Julie Johnson and Ashley Stone as well for their facilitation and thank all of you who've joined us. I don't know if there's a more important question that we're all it's, uh, that it is on our minds all the time these days because uh, the answers will help inform how we live in the next months, the months to come. Uh, Brian Labus, I want to say, has been a real important thought leader in our state and nationally, a professor in our School of Public Health, uh, a member of a team at the university who is uh, navigating the future, and also a governor's advisor about what well, what is the future of our engagement with the, the virus, uh, COVID-19? Um, and I want to say how much I personally learned from Dr. Labus when I had a chance to hear him speak about the virus, because he has a very, he has a very good judgment, first of all, and a very informed uh, set of uh, facts and ideas about how we navigate for the future. He also has the best interest of our community in, in mind, our students, faculty, and staff, and certainly has been a wonderful uh, leader in trying to help us move forward so that we safety is first and foremost, but that we can continue uh, well, doing what we're here to do, which is provide a stellar education to our students as a top tier university. So I, 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 I want to say, Dr. Labus, thank you so much for being with us today. People are very, very interested and concerned as one would expect about the future. And in our own college, as you know very well, we have some very particular interests about how do we welcome audiences back? How do we think about the visual performing arts, film, the School of Architecture, Entertainment, Engineering and Design? You know, and how do we begin our pathway from this moment on, the rest of the semester, the summer, the fall, uh, how do we deal? There are going to be many questions way beyond what I know right now, but how do we deal with people who have been vaccinated, who haven't been vaccinated? You brought up a very interesting subject when I spoke to you last about the culture of the stage and the culture of the audience and how do we differentiate them or not? Um, so. Would you like to make some opening remarks first, or would you like to get right to the questions that our audience is posing? I would, it's up to you. We're, I just want to say a huge thank you from all. Of <laughs> well, I'm very happy to be here, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I usually like just to give a couple couple minutes summary of where we're at right now with the pandemic, and uh, just kind of say here's here's the point we're at. So since the beginning of the year, we've seen the numbers for COVID drop way down. Um, that was basically the third wave of the virus. And now we're seeing nationwide a little bit of an increase in disease, which is not surprising as states have rolled back restrictions and mask use and things like that before they had everyone vaccinated. So everybody got excited we had a vaccine and started opening up everything and saying, yeah, we can go back to normal. Well, not quite yet. We're still at the point where the virus is circulating. In Nevada, we've seen the numbers go back above 5%, uh, but we've been in the 5 to 6% range for the last two or three weeks or so. And it hasn't really been skyrocketing yet because unlike the previous waves, we're vaccinating people. And now it's a race between vaccination and the virus. And that is really the, the challenge we have is we are racing a virus that keeps changing. Uh, and so these new variants show up and they spread more easily, which means it's, uh, a little more difficult to get uh, uh, the community vaccinated to the level where we're going to have some sort of herd immunity. We can talk about all that stuff in the, the Q&A, um, but it just makes it more challenging because we're fighting an enemy that's constantly changing. And so that's really what we're up against. As we get more and more people vaccinated, though, that keeps things under control. The real question, though, is how is this going to play out uh, basically over the fall semester? The summer is probably going to look a lot like 
what we're seeing now, there's going to be some disease transmission. But if we're talking into August, it's going to be really interesting to see where we're at and uh, how we can start to go back to normal. We've seen that things are switching from state control to county level control, and the county's already talked about uh, doing different things when we hit a certain percentage of people vaccinated, allowing different social distancing than we've had in the past. The only thing that the county cannot do is basically just ignore the mask mandate. So the governor has said that one stays in place, which I'm really happy to hear um, because I pushed him for months to get that one in place. So uh, that's something that I've been dealing with since early on in this pandemic, and I'm glad to see that that's going to stay in place. So we're not just going to have counties say, that's it, no more masks, because that's one of the best things we can do until everyone's vaccinated to stop disease transmission. Um, so right now, it's it's nice to be able to talk about things in a much more positive way than in the fall when the numbers were increasing day over day. But we can't give up on things. We have to keep doing what we've been doing until we have enough people vaccinated that this pandemic is under control. So with that, I know there's a lot of questions touching on a lot of topics. I'm happy to take ones that weren't sent in advance as well. Uh, really anything related to the virus, no question is is stupid. I'm happy to answer whatever you don't understand. So, um, I th so do you want me to go through the list or do you want to go through like a Q&A kind of panelist thing? What would you prefer? Either one's fine with me. Well, if you are are happy to go through the list, that would be great. Is that fine with you, Ashley? Sure. Yeah, okay, good. All right, so I've got I've got all the questions that were submitted here. I'll just go through them in order. Um, there were a lot of questions asking the same thing, so we're going to touch on the uh, a few times. Uh, but the first question is, what guidelines should we follow for musicians playing wind instruments? Uh, and this is probably one of the toughest questions to answer. I can't tell you exactly what to do um, because there isn't a set of national guidelines on here's how we approach things in a musical setting, depending on the type of instrument you play. You know, if you're playing a keyboard instrument, you're playing percussion, something like that, or guitar strings, it's easy because you can still wear a mask. So all the other things about social distancing and mask wearing, we can do that with those other instruments. For the wind instruments, it's a lot tougher. Um, and it's not just the fact that you're not wearing a mask, it's that you're breathing heavily to play these instruments and spreading the virus potentially some distance from uh, from that instrument if you have it. So um, the guidelines that we've been able to offer, uh, so there's there's two ways to think of it as well. There's guidelines based on the science, and then there's following the rules that the state has in place. Uh, so we do have to keep that in mind. Tomorrow, if the CDC said nobody ever has to wear a mask again, we still have our state rules, we still have our university rules, and we'd have to change those before we could do that. Uh, so there's going to be a lag between those things. But when it comes to the instruments, um, we look at them as potential sources, just like a person singing, projecting their voice, um, you know, anything on a stage uh, where there's a risk potentially to people around them. And so the best thing you can do is to be vaccinated. So if we have musicians who are all vaccinated, you could basically act like before COVID. Uh, the CDC guidance is people can gather together in a setting if they're all vaccinated and ignore social distancing and are not required to wear masks. So if everyone gets vaccinated, then the questions about what to do just go away because the risk is minimal because everyone's been vaccinated. So there's a the probability that you are infected and would spread it to somebody else is low. And even if they are exposed, everyone's been vaccinated. We know there has been breakthrough disease. It's rare, but it does occur. And when it does occur, it tends to be very, very mild because your immune system is basically primed. It just wasn't strong enough to fight it off, but you're not gonna wind up hospitalized. You're not gonna wind up dying. Uh, it would be a mild illness compared to those other ones. So unfortunately right now, the guidance for the wind instruments really hasn't changed. Uh, we're still saying that you've got to keep your distance from other people. It makes it very difficult to have more than one person uh, in a, it, like in a practice room or something like that. I know that's been an issue for months now. Um, I know we started talking about these things about a year ago with the fine arts department about how to do all these things because you had such challenging things that are integral to the your, your performing uh, that it, it makes it difficult to follow a lot of the guidance we have. But um, I wish there were something simple for wind instruments, but there really isn't right now. There's just a risk with that and you can't wear a mask while you're doing it. So the best recommendation is if everyone's vaccinated, then you don't have to worry about these problems and that's going to get rid of the the risk and we'll be able to basically go back to normal. Now, of course, the, uh, the, um, the university rules haven't changed on all this stuff yet, but once people start to get vaccinated, we'll discuss it. Now, um, with that, uh, we'll go to the next question. There's going to be a bunch of questions about this same topic, and I saw just one pop up in the chat as well. Same sort of idea. Uh, the question is, will UNLV be updating its immunization requirements for students to include the COVID-19 vaccine? 
Rutgers is doing it. I got another email today. The California schools are considering it as well. Um, there are a number of schools who are requiring this, and I'm. I'm not sure how this is going to work out. So administratively, this is something that NG has said they want to make the decision on. So it will not be a UNLV decision. It doesn't matter what we say. This is going to come from the chancellor's office. It will be a decision for all the schools in Nevada. Uh, and that would be something that would be changed in the NAC chapter that specifically has to do with student vaccination. The, um. There is that process in place for students. There isn't a process for requiring immunizations for faculty and staff, which is really strange. So we can require it for the students, but the faculty and staff do not have to get vaccinated, can't be forced to do any of these things. However, in an emergency like this, you could see all sorts of rules going into place. The challenge with this is that the vaccine has been approved under the FDA's emergency use authorization statutes. The EUA statutes are a little different than a full FDA approval. It recognizes that there are emergencies where we don't have time to do as long of a study. Um, but there's such a need for these things that in, an, in a pandemic, uh, we can approve vaccines, drugs, things like that and use them. Um, but as part of those statutes, it does say that you can't require that somebody gets vaccinated. So I don't understand how all these schools are planning to do this and actually follow the law when it comes to a vaccine that's only been approved uh, under emergency use authorization. Now, as a public health person, I would love to see every vaccine mandated for every single person in the state, uh, and I will push for that whenever I can. But being re realistic about putting this into place at UNLV, I don't know that we have the legal backing to do it. I don't know how these other schools are going to do it. I have a feeling this will be one of the things that the courts winds up deciding, because all it's going to take is one student at one of those schools to refuse, not be allowed to sign up for classes and because they're state schools there's the whole issue of the government having to follow the government's rules maybe a little different with private schools but rutgers is a public university the california system is obviously public we'll see what the courts say about it whether it's even legal to do that or not uh, but right now we've essentially been preempted from doing that at unlv because the um, the state system wants to do that, and I think they have the same concerns that anyone does. I mean, of course, there's always the uh, just the whole challenge of putting something like that in place. But the question is, do we really have the legal authority to do that? Um, so right now we have not heard. I have not heard any rumblings or anything that it's going to be required. But if every state around us does it, I wouldn't be surprised to see us add it to the list. But it still doesn't change anything for faculty and staff, which is kind of a problem. You know, we're vaccinate some of the people that are there in the classroom, but not everybody. Um, so we will see about that. All right, the next uh, if if yes. I might, we got I got a question um, sent right around those same lines. Um, can particular classes required that all students be vaccinated? For example, um, Coral Corral, can that be required that all students be vaccinated in order to participate? Um. I don't think so, not without NG saying that that's allowed. So okay. if one individual faculty member decides they want everyone in their back in their classroom vaccinated, that is going to be an ugly mess. Um, it's one of those fights that I'm sure the faculty senate will be involved in, the president and everybody else, um, because it's obviously we want everyone protected. We want everyone in the classroom vaccinated, but to require it as something that you have to have to get into that class that's going to pose a lot of problems. I haven't seen an official policy that you're not allowed to do it, um, but I don't think we want individual faculty members making that decision and requiring it. There's a piece of it that is a, a huge challenge, which is how do you enforce it? So if I were a student and my professor said, I want to see your vaccination card, I don't know that I want to show them those sort of things. You know, I don't know how much information I'm willing to share. Plus, does the professor have the ability to ensure that it's not a fake card? Um, really, it's a, a paper card. There's no way for that faculty member to look it up. Um, so that's going to be a huge challenge. That's the same thing we've talked about throughout the university is how do you enforce something like that? With students going, you know, making it a mandatory vaccination, you provide those records. It goes into your student record. The student health center has all that stuff. That's one thing. But if you're going to do it with just an individual class, um, I could see us preempting that and say that's not allowed just because it, it causes so many problems if we're doing it different for different classes. And I don't know that. I mean, the legal differences between those classes and the university, there isn't one. So if we can't do it as a university, you can't do it as an individual faculty member. 
this is not a, a voluntary thing. It's part of your classwork. So mm -hmm. uh, it'd be very difficult to do that sort of thing. But I'm sure that okay. question is going to come up. I've mentioned it already. I know it's something we're going to have to deal with because somebody's just going to put it in their syllabus somewhere and it's going to be a headache for all of us who have to deal with it. Okay. And along those same lines, should the state between now and the fall lift the mask mandate? Will uh, we be able to, we as a university and or we as individually faculty members, be able to require uh, students wear masks in individual classes and or on campus and enforce that, say, in uh, a music class or dance class or whatever it might be? So luckily, that's a very different situation. We're not talking about giving somebody an FDA approved biologic product. Uh, requiring a mask would be like requiring shoes on campus, or if we wanted to require something for the safety of people beyond what's basically required by the law. We do all sorts of things to, to require students to do different things. We could decide to keep a, a mask mandate in, play, in place if the governor rolled it back and said we're not going to, to require it at this point. Um, I'm surprised at the fact that he has said this is something that's going to stay in place and he had no plans to get rid of it soon. It was difficult to convince him to do it. He was very concerned about, um, we, we heard about violence toward people that were trying to enforce the mask mandates. There was a, a security guard shot and killed telling somebody they had to wear a mask to come into a grocery store or something like that. And we didn't want those things to happen in Nevada. We're basically taking, you know, sometimes high school kids making minimum wage, putting them by the door, and now they're getting screamed at by the public. And so there was a concern for their safety, but we're past that point now. Uh, and he is wholeheartedly um, supported that the mask mandate when other places have gotten rid of it, and he doesn't seem to be in any hurry to remove it. However, I think we would have the opportunity to say something unless his new rule said that nobody is allowed to put in a mask mandate. Uh, I can't see him doing that. He's basically turned the authority over to the counties, and the counties could decide that they're going to keep it in place, even though it's not a statewide requirement. So we could still have requirements from outside, but it could be something that that we decide to do. Obviously, we do that stuff in medical settings all the time. We make people wear PPE, um, but it is something that we could choose to do. I can't see us saying individual classes will be allowed to make that decision because that's going to be a, a giant mess for the university to enforce uh, if we try to do something like that. I wouldn't say that it's it's probably going to be, we'll all do it or none of us will do it. Um, but um, we don't have the same prohibitions against doing it as we do with the vaccination. Thank you, Nancy. I'm sorry. I just wanted to jump in and ask those couple of questions. I, for, I think all of these answers are so are so important for our audience and for all of us. Julie, I think they were excellent questions and I, I, I think that uh, Dr. Labus will continue his his uh, questions in front of him now. Thank you. So I, I think we've answered the next one. There are other public universities in the US that are requiring that students be vaccinated before they return. Why can't we do that? So we've talked about that. All right, the next one is how will social distancing work in the classroom? This is a really fascinating one that just as a faculty member, I didn't understand the complexity of something like this until we started talking about scheduling classes because the distance that we put between students directly determines our enrollment for the fall because we'll have a room that it's, it's a certain physical size and if we wanna keep people X feet apart, there are only so many people you can put in those rooms. So with the six foot social distancing, which is what we have in place right now, uh, we're limited to a certain percentage. The county has said that they wanna move to the three foot social distancing, um, basically once they hit a certain percentage of people vaccinated. So that could be something that we're allowed to do in the fall. In the, uh, the grade schools, elementary and high school, um, they have decreased the social distancing between people from six feet to three feet. Uh, and that was uh, a lot of that was based on uh, there's an American Academy of Pediatrics review of all the different things related to protecting students in school. And one of the things they said was, if the only thing that's keeping kids out of the classroom is the six foot mandate, that could be something that you could shrink uh, as long as you had all these other things in place to still protect people, but allow us to return because they don't want it to be just this, this six foot distance to be the one thing that keeps us from gathering together and having an actual class. Um, the, for me, it's a little strange to have, say that three feet is okay and uh, because it's really based on the science of the how far the particles travel from your mouth. Um, they are a large droplet particles within about six feet fall out of the air. And so that six foot distance past that is where the risk really drops off. Within three feet, there's still a lot of risk right there. Uh, but if we have a lot of people vaccinated, that's not going to matter as much. So 
the social distancing in classrooms is going to be very interesting because that's something we need to decrease if we want to have in person classes in the fall. We cannot keep it at six feet and still get the same number of people onto campus as we did before. We just don't have the space for that. Uh, so this is something that that we're paying close attention to. We're, we're talking with the county as they're coming up with their new rules. Uh, they asked all the different people involved about you know what sort of things are important to you, and that was something UNLV brought up was, well, this is something we have to have some control over because right now it really limits our ability to have in-person classes. So um, I could see it going to a, a shorter distance, but that's really a decision from the county. If the county says we're sticking with six feet and there's limitations on how many people, that's really all we can do is follow it and say, this is the best we can do at UNLV. So we are trying to go back in person, but it's just one of those things that it's kind of out of our hands at this point. And we'll see what the county decides and how the pandemic plays out over the next few months as we get into the uh, back to school for the fall. All right, uh, can we ask if individuals have been vaccinated that are performing? You can always ask, they don't have to answer though. That's the problem we get into. How do you verify it? Um, there's also situations like, think about a, a faculty meeting where everybody sits in one room and you know, if the dean's running the meeting and says, all right, put your hand up if you haven't been vaccinated, nobody's going to put their hand up. There's so much social pressure that nobody's going to say, no, I'm the one that didn't get vaccinated. And now everybody takes their masks off and you have unvaccinated and vaccinated people mixed. And that's a huge problem. So, so you can ask those sort of things, but they don't have to answer. Um, and if they are answering, there's no way to verify that that's really the truth. You know, if they're an anti-vaxxer, and they don't want to be hassled by you. They could say, oh, yeah, I got vaccinated the first day I was available. You're going to leave them alone. You're not going to check anything after that. Um, that's kind of the, the problem, though, is how do we verify those things to know that we have all vaccinated people in those performing venues? So it makes it really tough to use that as a thing that, that decides how we're going to gather together. It's, I think, ultimately going to come down to the percentage of people who are vaccinated in the community on campus, things like that, where we can say we have a great a uh, high percentage of our people vaccinated, so it's acceptable to bring people together vaccinated and unvaccinated uh, for whatever this performance is. All right, so will proof of COVID vaccination be required for all students planning to attend this fall? I think we've covered that. Um, if the current COVID vaccines receive full FDA approval before the fall, will UNLV require all students to receive the vaccine? That is a very interesting question. I think that if that happens, it will completely change the conversation because now there wouldn't be those same legal issues with trying to get people vaccinated. Uh, we could add that to the list of required vaccinations. Um, so it's it's something that reasonably could be done at that point, um, but we'll have to see what happens. Uh, I haven't heard of anyone going to the FDA yet and seeking the full approval. Uh, Pfizer went back to them last week and is seeking approval for 12 to 16 year olds. So basically we could have all high school kids vaccinated. But I have not heard anything related to the full FDA approval. It's still under the emergency use um, for the vaccine manufacturers. It's a lot of work for the full approval right now, and it makes sense just to keep collecting data, do all their studies and then you know, apply for approval all at once rather than do it now because they already have their audience, they already have their, you know, the people they can sell the vaccine to. So there isn't much of a benefit to them unless these issues start to come up, then then maybe that'll happen. But that really will change, I think, a lot of the conversation about uh, the vaccines. I just don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, they haven't applied for that yet. So uh, it could occur, but right now it's really hard to say what's going to happen by that. Uh, all right, are students taking on campus classes required to be fully vaccinated before the fall semester? Right. Uh, do we need to continue social distancing on or off stage? Uh, the answer is yes, because those are still the rules for Nevada. Uh, we are following whatever the rules are from the state, and that's going to be turned over to the county very soon, and they're going to make the same decisions. Now that we've seen a decrease in disease and an increase in vaccination, the whole conversation about restarting performances is driving a lot of these discussions, which is great to see. I really miss concerts. I can't wait to go back to them. But at the same time, I don't know if I want to be in a crowd of people in the, the general admission tickets all up uh, next to the stage. They're really crammed together. Um, and those are the things that we're talking about. There's a distance between the performers and the audience. Um, it was, I think, 25 feet. We've, we've shrunk it down. There were some uh, some new guidance that I got to be part of writing uh, a couple of weeks ago where we came up with uh, new rules on karaoke. Um, I can't believe that's 
what I spent my time doing, but there were a lot of questions about it. How do you do it in an open karaoke area and the private rooms and all those kind of things? So we looked into that and decided what would be safe with that to come up with some way to reopen all the different karaoke places. Um, so there still needs to be that social distancing because the rules are still in place that you basically have to do that. The performers are treated very differently than the audience, though. So you could have people on stage without masks doing a performance as a group. So you could have a band up on stage or an ensemble or something like that. Um, you could have actors on stage performing without masks for their performance. Then when you go off stage, you put the mask back on, you do those things just like we do. Um, excuse me. <coughs> just like we do for any sporting event. Uh, so we're not seeing people wearing masks when they're playing whatever sporting event it is. They, all those sports do have a testing process and they try to vaccinate everybody and all that, but still they're allowed to remove the masks and do those things. And they have been throughout the pandemic. You haven't seen football teams playing with a mask, but when they go to the sidelines, they start to put that stuff on. It's the same sort of thing here. So as you're performing, as you're doing those things that require you to remove the mask, you can do those things. And then when that ends, you have to put it back on because otherwise it, it affects the performance. You know, you can't sing easily with the mask on or something like that. So um, the, the audience is completely different though. And then and we keep those separate um, so that we can do those things on the stage with more restrictions. And then the audience is handled differently with occupancy restrictions and things like that. So um, that's, that's where we're at right now. If those rules change, those are things that are going to come from the county and will apply to us just like they do every single show on the strip. And I know there's a lot of pressure to basically do as much as we can to, to restart the entire entertainment industry here. So you'll probably hear about a lot of those things as it moves to the county and they approve all their guidance over the next couple of months and and restart all sorts of different things. Um, they've already been talking about uh, pretty much reopening just about everything that's been closed. They're talking about buffets reopening, changes in restaurants. They're going to allow the strip clubs to reopen. Those have been closed since March of last year. The the strip clubs and the brothels and the, the nightclubs are the things that have been closed since the beginning of this pandemic. And now we're trying to figure out how to reopen those things. Uh, Nevada is a really interesting place, isn't it? Um, those are the things, though, that we've held off on. We said, you know, how can you safely operate a brothel and maintain six feet distance? It just doesn't work, you know? So, so we had those kind of concerns. Um, same thing with the strip clubs. There's distance between the performers and the audience. It still is performing though. And so um, those are the things that they're trying to come up with guidelines now that allow us to do those things as much as possible and still protect people. I think you'll still see a kind of a separation between the, the performers and the audience, which may cause some challenges for some of the venues we have on campus, you know, ham hall is not going to be a problem. You can close a couple of rows. Uh, but if you have, you know, the experimental theater, things like that, where people are right on top of the stage all around it, it's going to be a little more challenging to follow the county rules. But um, we also have the ability to ask for exemptions. So if we say this is a particular situation that's a little strange and it doesn't match your rules, you can go to the county commission and ask for basically a waiver where you can do something different. We do this all the time with all of our environmental health regulations. If you're going to open a restaurant, and you want to do something slightly different than the, the food code says. There's a process for that. And now that it will be at the county level, um, I'm sure we'll have that opportunity if, if we if it's something we decide we really need to do. All right, uh, will UNLV still have on site COVID testing when the fall semester starts? Um, that is a good question. I think they're still trying to figure out some of those pieces. Um, maybe, maybe not. We're probably still going to have COVID testing through the student health center, no matter what. The whole idea of having the large public COVID testing is a different one, though. Uh, even the vaccination clinics, it's something that we're talking about. Well, we're still going to maintain these large vaccination clinics because um, it's a huge logistical operation. And if the demand isn't there, then it's really hard to keep open a clinic that's designed to do a couple thousand people a day. You know, if you're only getting a couple hundred, well, we could turn that over to the, the grocery stores, the pharmacies, the doctor's offices, places like that, and not take over half the student union with our um, with our vaccination clinic. So uh, they've already closed or plan to close Cashman as the public vaccination place because they had a huge demand for it. Uh, now it's moving on to the, the second dose and then that, that first dose requirement or the first dose uh, demand has gone way down um, as we've opened it to everybody. And I think that's, for me, that's a huge concern. Not that we're closing these places, but that the demand isn't there to sustain them. 
Uh, I think we've gotten through the people who definitely wanted to get vaccinated. Now we're starting to get to the, the wave of people who are either kind of ambivalent about it or hesitant about it. And then we're going to hit those people who never want to get vaccinated. Uh, I was hoping we would have a lot more demand before we hit them, but that's just something until until we do it, we don't know where it's going to be. So um, there will still be places to get tested on campus in the fall. I just don't know if we're going to keep the, the county testing center. We've been running it for a year. Um, at some point, all these things have to stop. We can't use half of the campus to maintain operations for the county. We want to get back to normal. We want to reopen things, and that's a big discussion. You know, half the union is closed all the time. We can't use the union like we normally do. We can't have meetings. We can't have events like we're used to if it's set up for a vaccination clinic. And we want to get back to normal. So, uh, but there will be a, cha a place to get tested at least on campus through the student health center, I believe. All right, well, in-person classes be holding tests and assignments done online and lectures in person. Uh, if you want, uh, there's a lot of flexibility in that. That's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, you've always had the option to do that. You can do an online test and an in-person lecture. Uh, it won't be a requirement or anything like that. Um, I think it'll be up to the individual instructors to do those sort of things if that's the way they want to set it up. I've had classes where I've done that just because it's easier to do a, an online test rather than have students show up and just cheat off each other on bubble sheets, uh, just have them cheat off each other on the computer instead. But um, that's something that's your option as a faculty member to do that. Uh, and it really comes down to the best way that you think you can set up the class. I don't see it as a requirement. It's nothing that we've discussed where we said we want to do parts of it online and parts of it in person. Um, so I think that's something that you'll have the option to do just like you always have. All right, musicians usually sit almost on top of each other while playing instruments. When can that happen again? Um, hopefully very soon. I, I think the we need to get people vaccinated before we can move to that point. Um, and that's when the county is going to be comfortable saying, OK, here's the new rules. We can start to do the things the way that we used to. But right now, um, Musicians are treated just like any other occupation. Basically, uh, if you're working with people, you have to maintain a distance between you and that person next to you. And so, unfortunately, until all those things change for for the county, it's going to be difficult to do that. There are uh, exceptions made for performances and things like that, but we still don't want to have a large orchestra all crammed together into a tiny space because there's just a lot of risk of, of disease transmission if there's a sick person there. Um, but we're heading in that direction. We're just not quite there yet. Uh, can UNLV purchase UV light and HVAC systems to combat the spread of COVID-19? Um, they've looked into all these things. They've looked into how do we basically uh, meet the the ASHRAE guidelines and have the right levels of filtration and air circulation and that. Um, the guidelines give a lot of flexibility because there's certain things that they recommend that you just can't do in Las Vegas. So there's a certain number of uh, a certain amount of outside air that you want to bring into the building, and that's always going to be better. But if you try to do that when it's 115 degrees outside, you will never be able to cool it. The building is always going to be 90 degrees. And so they have those technical kind of limitations on setting things up. Um, the UV light can can do those sort of things, but what we're most concerned about is people sitting close to each other and these large droplets. It's not as much the, the COVID particles that would be through the HVAC system uh, that we're concerned about. It's really people on top of each other. So I know they've looked into all those things. They've done the, they've basically done as much as they reasonably can uh, in all these different buildings. Uh, some of the, some of the buildings are just old enough where it's very difficult to, to retrofit some of these things. I know some of the spaces that uh, the performance spaces are like that, where it's just, they're older buildings and they're very difficult to make any of those kind of changes. Uh, but they've looked into everything that they they can. I'm sure they've looked into the UV. Uh, it's not something we're using right now, but it's also not something that's being pushed extensively. It's an option that's out there, uh, but they've tried to do as much as they can to protect everybody. And our, our biggest thing was basically not having people on campus. Uh, and as we start to come back from that, then they'll probably look at it again and decide if those things could provide added protection. If it only provides added cost with no added protection, it's something we're not going to do, unfortunately. Do you think we'll ever return to normal and when will that be? Um, no, and I don't know. Um, and the reason I say no is because normal has changed. It, it, we're not ever going to go back to the way that things were before COVID. Uh, I don't think we can. When we go through a, a year and a half long pandemic, this is our you know, flu uh, influenza pandemic from a century ago. This is the Black Plague dust. This is something that has 
uh, made huge changes to everything in our community, the way we interact with each other, the number of meetings that we've had that realized we could just do as an email, you know, all those things. Um, it's changed the way we interact with people. And so I don't see us ever going back to the way we are before. I'm putting together a presentation on kind of lessons about COVID for the future for an environmental health group. And the first picture I have is a little kid blowing on a birthday cake. Uh, and I'm thinking, would I ever go back to that where it's like, all right, somebody's birthday, they're going to spit on a cake, everyone have a piece of cake now. And it's weird just to think about things like that. Are we going to shake hands or fist bump or bump elbow? You know, all that stuff is different. Um, so I don't think we'll ever go back to normal. Now we will go back to whatever that that new normal is where we interact with people where we go back to offices, but we did a big experiment here. Where we looked about, can we do things remotely? And we showed that we can do a lot of things remotely. Some things don't work, but you don't have to do every single thing that we used to do in person. Um, you know, I can teach online. I prefer to do it in person, but I've learned how to do things online that I didn't think were possible before. And for some things, online is even better. We're going to switch to that. You know, meetings, uh, we're just used to doing all these video meetings now and not uh, phone conferences. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was used to dialing into phone conferences all the time. Even like with the governor's group, we would get together and it was a phone call that would go on for two hours. And now it's a video chat. Uh, and that just seems normal now. It wasn't a year ago, but it is now. And so that's what that new normal is. Now, as for when that's going to be, um, thinking on academic semesters, I think we're going to start to get back to normal for this fall semester. Um, because we function in kind of these 16 week blocks, we can't just do something halfway through the semester. Um, it's not like all of a sudden we're going to do in person in the middle of October or something like that. And so uh, we kind of look at it like the way we start the semester, that's the way we're going to continue things throughout unless we have to back off back off of it, obviously for an emergency. But um, and so the plan is to get back to as normal as possible for the fall semester. I'm still there. There will probably still be some restrictions. There'll be things that we'll have to do. Um, so the fall will look a lot more like normal. And if we keep vaccinating people by spring, there's no reason why these things can't all go away. Well, we're not wearing masks. We're not worrying about these things anymore. And, uh, and we basically, uh, this has become a disease that's kind of in the background now and not something we're dealing with every single day. All right. What risk mitigation will UNLV take to combat the mutant variants of COVID-19? Considering we have many students uh, who come from abroad to study here, um, I wouldn't worry about international students bringing different mutations to the United States. These things pop up all over the place. Uh, we live in a tourist town, and so somebody's always going to be bringing these things to town. It's something that we always deal with with influenza or norovirus or whatever it is. Somebody is always bringing a disease to Las Vegas. Plus, the residents of Las Vegas are going to travel all over the place. You know, if there's a a new strain in Southern California, it's going to be here the next day. Um, and so I wouldn't worry about that particular piece about how it's going to get here. Basically, what happens is once one of these uh, these strains is introduced, it outcompetes the other strains and becomes the dominant one. Um, and we've seen that over the course of the pandemic. Everybody keeps thinking about these variants that have occurred over the past couple of months. The variant that spread in the United States starting a year ago in March was actually a variant of the original strain from Wuhan. So we had a strain that spread more easily than the one that caused the outbreak in China. Um, I don't know where that one came from, but that was the one that was the dominant strain in the world, and it was different than the one that we saw at the beginning of the pandemic. So this happens constantly. We know that there are always going to be variants. The vaccines that we have are still effective against the variants because they don't change that much that the vaccine doesn't recognize them at all. Uh, they may be a little less effective in some cases, depending what the variant is, but they still provide protection. Um, they still prevent hospitalization and death. That's really the biggest thing. Um, but that vaccine is still going to work. The vaccine manufacturers, though, have looked at that issue, and because it's an mRNA vaccine, all you have to do is essentially change the instructions for what's inside that vaccine, and they could make the new one tomorrow. It doesn't really take time for them to, to switch it, because all they're doing is changing a piece of genetic material, and that's coming basically from a computer file that's uploaded to a machine that now creates this, uh, this genetic code. So to me, the mRNA vaccines are absolutely fascinating. They are the biggest thing that's going to come out of this pandemic, and it's going to completely revolutionize the way we deal with infectious diseases over the next century. These vaccines absolutely amaze me. Um, I see it as a platform. It's not the COVID vaccine. It is, it's the way we're going to deal with infectious diseases from now on, and I think that's just absolutely incredible. We're going to have vaccines for, uh, for things that are not cost effective to make right now because we don't have to set up a new manufacturing process. We just change a little bit of genetic material, and now we've got a Lyme disease vaccine or a dengue fever vaccine or whatever it is. So we'll be able to do all sorts of amazing things. All right, I'll get off that little tangent. But um, so I, I, if you can't tell, I love the vaccines. Um, 
so so the vaccines are a huge piece of it. The other piece of it is what happens with these um, with these strains is they spread more easily. That's what we've basically seen. We haven't really seen issues with greater rates of hospitalization and death. Um, we typically don't see a lot more severe strains uh, start to, to come out. Uh, things spread more easily uh, because that's in the best interest of the virus. The problem is if something kills people quickly, it makes it harder to actually spread. So if you get infected and you die sooner, you can infect fewer people. And so that's actually not um, good for the virus. And so those things have some selection pressure against them. But in terms of something that spreads more easily, um, that's what we've been dealing with all along. And so with that, that's why we're still having the mask mandate and the social distancing and all the things that we put in place, because that allows us to combat those those additional variants, even ones that we haven't discovered yet. Those are the things that are still going to work to slow down the transmission. And that's what we need to do until we can get enough people vaccinated that it, it really provides protection at the group level. All right, so those were all the questions in the, uh, uh, the file that was sent me. So I know some others have popped up in chat. So let's move over to those. All right. Uh, university hasn't required vaccines since not everyone is guaranteed to be vaccinated. Will the fine arts regulate masks in choral ensembles? Um, I, I will defer to the Dean on this, but my guess is we're not going to do special things for one group of one department, but uh, um, I'll, I'll let you answer that one. <laughs> well, I think that we're going to use uh, the guidance of the university to help us figure things out. Uh, but, but having said that, we always want to do everything we can to provide the best possible education for our students as well. So we'll have to put those two things, two uh, pathways together and do the best we can. I, I think that one of the uh, issues moving forward, and I think we experienced it for the last year and a half, is that um, we perfect is not in our world. We're not going to find it, but we're going to do the very best we can. And we're going to all, I think, all become more resilient as a result of it. And I, I with all the loss and devastation about which we feel terrible, I, I feel strongly, and I'm saying that I'm going to, um, you know, populate my remarks with this at graduation, is that we've also learned a great deal and we've become resilient. And I think our students in many ways will go out into the world, our graduates, um, being able to deal with challenges in a different way. And also recognize, Dr. Leibis, what you said that normal, the word normal will keep changing for in our world. And so I just, um, I, I, I think that we're going to have to work on a case by case basis, have guidance from the university, and also try as hard as we can not to disrupt the education that we, that, that our students so richly deserve. I'm glad you said uh, the comment about. You know, not trying to be perfect. Uh, that's spoke. That's really the approach we take in epidemiology. So you can be an honorary epidemiologist. Um, what we try to do is not eliminate risk. We try to reduce risk because it's not realistic to completely eliminate risk. The only way you can do that is stay home and never leave your house. Um, if we're going to gather together, there's going to be some amount of risk. But what we want to do is minimize that. Um, and the other thing we have to do is think about. Comparative risk. Uh, lately, people have freaked out about the the blood clots and the J and J vaccine, and it is something that has happened literally one in a million times to people who are vaccinated. We had six people with the blood clots uh, out of seven million people that were vaccinated. Now, I don't want to say that I don't care about those people. I don't want it to sound like that at all. But we're talking about comparative risk. So, first of all, we haven't shown that that truly is a connection, and there may be other things there. They've all been younger women. There may be an association with birth control pills or smoking or things that cause blood clots anyway. But even if we assume that that vaccine caused blood clots and it does it in one in a million people, we're talking about a disease that's killed over 500,000 people. We lose more people an hour. We've been losing more an hour since the beginning of this pandemic than have died from that particular vaccine. And so you're talking about a risk of one in a million versus a disease that if we do nothing will infect 60 to 70% of the population and maybe kill 1%. Your risk of dying is much greater in a car accident driving to get vaccinated than it is to have blood clots from the vaccination itself. And I think that's the way we look at vaccines. So even if we say the J&J &J vaccine does carry this risk and here are the people who need to, maybe you shouldn't even get it because they're high risk for it. Um, it's still orders of magnitude safer than the getting the disease itself. 
And so those are the ways that epidemiologists look at the world. It's all about comparative risk. We don't expect that vaccine to be perfect. We know that there will be people that have bad outcomes from the vaccine. Most of the time, it's just a sore arm and things like that. But some people will be um, damaged for the rest of their life because of that vaccine. But it is a very rare event, and the risk is so much lower than the same problems happening from the disease itself that it makes sense to, you know, you're in Vegas. You play the odds. You go with a thing that's going to be much, much safer, and that's why we're telling people to get vaccinated. Uh, even knowing that there are those risks, it is still much, much safer than the natural disease. So that's the way we approach things. We want to reduce risk as much as we can. We don't want to ex expose people to unnecessary risks or levels that we think are unreasonable, but we are aware that there can be problems if we're going to interact with other people. Nothing is perfect. Six feet is not a magic wall between you and the next person. Vaccinations are not 100% effective, but they're pretty close to it when it comes to hospitalization and death. So we consider all those things and we're really trying to make it as safe of an environment as possible. Um, I, I think that's the reasonable standard that we need to set for ourselves. We cannot expect this to be a perfectly safe environment. Anytime you interact with other people, there's always going to be some risk of all sorts of diseases, uh, but we're gonna do everything we can to eliminate any unnecessary or, or elevated risks for our students, our faculty, our staff, or any of the people coming to performances. Uh, Brian, thank you. Um, Ashley's been doing a good job trying to eliminate all the duplicate questions. So we have them listed out for you and make it a little easier. Uh, I have one from a, uh, a admin faculty member who asks, do you have recommendations for offices and areas receiving student traffic? Should appointments still be required before people come to an office and a drop in's okay? Can people just come in and wait together again, or what are the new guidelines going to be? Um, so the reason we did appointments was to keep crowds of people from showing up all at once. Uh, think of like the you know the financial aid office the week before school starts. If you have drop-ins, there's a line around the building. So you put appointments in place to try and minimize the number of people who are all crammed together at any one time. Um, so I would say we want to go back to normal. We've talked about this a lot in our incident management planning group. You know, everybody's coming back to campus July 1st. What is that going to look like? What are the admin pieces that we're going to uh, go back to in person? Which pieces can we do remotely? Um, and we want to have a lot of things on campus. We want to have those offices where people can drop in. Um, and so we may have to adjust it a little bit where we want people not to to line up or form a big group in that particular area, but we definitely want to have those things. And I think as we get more and more people vaccinated, we'll feel more comfortable doing that and not requiring appointments and allowing people to drop in because students want to do that thing. They have a, they have a thought, they have a question, they want to deal with it right now. They don't want to make an appointment and come back to it when they're not angry, you know, two days from now. They want to deal with it right now and yell at somebody in person or ask a question or whatever it is. Um, and we want to allow that just like the way things were before, although we may have to have, um, you know, if, if it gets too busy, if it's a constant parade of people and it's uh, putting an elevated risk for the people that are working there, we uh, obviously have to come up with a way to deal with that. But I, I think our approach all along has been what's reasonable. How can we try to go back to as normal as possible without exposing people unnecessarily uh, or making it inconvenient? Um, so I could see us going back to the more in person things with actually having our faculty and staff on campus, having students drop in for appointments and all those kind of things. Uh, you know, we may not have the same size waiting room as before. We may spread chairs out into the hall or something like that, but uh, we will hopefully be back to those sort of things in the fall. Great. Are you, the, question, the, the last part of that about what are the new guidelines, um, those are still being determined by the county. Um, so as we get the guidance on what we can and can't do, the university guidelines will change. So I can't say what those are, but we definitely will be adjusting everything and letting everyone know as soon as we know what's officially going on. I just want to say, I know it's an, this is an important question that's in the queue that has that some of our performing arts, especially leadership, wants to want to know if we could require a negative COVID test before a rehearsal. I'm, I'm not looking at the question, so I may not have it exactly right. But I remember that in a previous conversation with some of our leadership, you, we were we were making an analogy to in the athletic program where there was an before people went on the field or something, they did get a rapid some kind of a rapid test where they knew they were negative because as you correctly said, we're not really going to know who's who's vaccinated, who isn't. And there is some mythology, I think, among some of our community about the dangers of vaccination. And that's, you know, we know that this is part of our world. 
we, we think that some students may choose not to get vaccinated. And so this is a question that's very important to some of our leadership. You know, is there a way we can protect the people in a rehearsal before they before the rehearsal starts? where we see that the, that the COVID test is negative. Do you think that's going to be possible in the fall? I think it's possible. And I think another interesting aspect of that would be if you pair that with vaccination. So basically it's what Electric Daisy proposed to do in May. They pushed it back because bringing a quarter million people together uh, in May is a really bad idea here. But um, their plan was you have to either show that you're vaccinated or have a negative COVID test within I think 48 hours of, of the event. Um, and that basically is a way to almost require vaccination, but not require because you have another option. So if you're vaccinated, you don't have to get tested. If you don't want to get vaccinated, okay, just get tested. You have an option there and nothing's going to keep you out. So that's what we've been talking about with vaccine passports. The challenge with that is how do we verify those things? You know, how do you ensure that it's a real test result and not one that somebody made up in Word and printed out and brought with them? Um, so that's the difficult piece. And that's where we've been talking about vaccine passports nationwide. That's gotten a lot of pushback from different places, but it was never meant to be a government requirement. It was just a a platform to allow people who want to do that uh, a way to do it and verify that it's the case. So I could see that being an option. That seems like a very reasonable option that will probably hold up to those legal standards. You can't use it for class though, because you'd require every student to get tested basically every single day. And that doesn't make sense. But if you're talking about individual performances, putting those sort of things together seems perfectly reasonable. Requiring a negative COVID test is something that, uh, like you said, athletics has been doing for, uh, for months now. So I think that's something that we would absolutely be able to do. The question is just how do we do it in a way that ensures that it truly is their, their lab result and protects their medical privacy and all those sort of things. Thank you. Are there other questions? Sorry about you? that. Oh. Yes, we have, we have, uh, are there other questions? Dean Usher. Um, <laughs> Some some people want to know if you're familiar with the major aerosol study for musicians, um, results of which were just released this past week. It still recommends masks for singers and instrumentalists when rehearsing and performing. Um, that's I, I haven't seen the results of that particular study. I know that stuff they've been working on for a long time, and if that's what they recommend, um, I don't know if that includes vaccination because these studies started months ago before the vaccine was available. So, and I know a lot of them were um, done in places where the you know people that are performing didn't have access to the vaccines yet. So, um, if vaccines weren't part of the question, yes, I absolutely agree with all that stuff. Adding vaccination to this completely changes that conversation, but I haven't seen that particular study, the results of it, so I can't really comment on it. But if they didn't include vaccination, that's the thing that really changed all this. If you would have asked me before the vaccine was available, that makes perfect sense that you have to wear masks and do all those things. And, you know, I've seen the picture of like the mask taped over the bell of the tuba. Uh, you know, you could do those sort of things and say, hey, I got my mask on. But um, with the vaccine, that that really changes the way we have these discussions because it's not about transmission anymore. It's about preventing it before you're ever exposed. Thank you. Um, and this might be for the both of you from a university and from a college perspective. What is protocol for dealing with students or performance um, exhibition event attendees who will not comply with campus protocol? I think, you know, I would look for guidance from, from the, the group that is, which includes the expertise of Dr. Labus and includes the, the university uh, leadership, I would look for guidance. Uh, I think that what I heard was it, it, that such a situation would go through the usual university protocols, um, you know, because I think that we want to use the tools that we have as much as possible uh, to regulate uh, the safety for all on campus. But I'd be very interested in your answer. Um, we are just starting to discuss the all these other events starting back up over the past year. We've only allowed UNLV events where it's UNLV students and people that the, the normal disciplinary procedures apply to all of them. So we had either employees or we had students. You know, we had the student conduct process. We have just the normal employee process there. Um, we are just at the point now where these things are starting to come up. We're starting to get requests for other events. 
um, and trying to find a way that actually makes it easy for the venues to allow the events to occur. So you don't have to submit an approval for every single event that's going on. You basically would submit kind of a, a venue plan and say, this is what we're going to do. And we'd say, yeah, that looks good. And we'd say, okay, it's your responsibility. Go ahead and do it now. So that's the way we've, we've been approaching it. Um, we haven't discussed that particular piece in terms of these events, but we have discussed it over the past year of just people on campus. If we had, um, for whatever reason, people coming to campus, protests, just walking around, whatever it is, we started talking about this last spring when we had a lot of the protests in the area, and we're, you know, how do we deal with large groups of people on campus and all that? Um, and the goal is not to get police involved if necessary, but if you have somebody who's disruptive or violent or something like that, you would do the same thing you did before you ever heard of COVID. Um, you know, if you, I, I, I like the idea of using the process that we already have in place because that's that's what we established. That's what works. You're probably going to find some people who are uncooperative because of the mask, but it's not like they've never heard of masks. It's not like they didn't hear about it when they got their ticket. Um, and so hopefully those events will be relatively rare. Most of the time it'll be telling somebody to put their mask on and them grudgingly doing it, but not really fighting with you and arguing about it's my right not to wear a mask and all that stuff. So that really hasn't happened very often with students. It hasn't been an issue over the last year, and I don't think it'll be a major issue going forward. I guess we'll find out uh, in a month when we have graduation, how many parents want to take their masks off and do all that kind of stuff. So that'll be our, our first uh, test run for dealing with the public and uh, how they feel about these events and wearing masks. <laughs> yes, it will. Um, okay, I think we have time for just one more. And then if there's anything you'd like to add, do you think, and I don't think you've answered this yet. There's so much, you just given us so much information. Do you think we will need to be vaccinated for COVID-19 every year like the flu? This is a really good question and the official answer is nobody knows. Uh, the reason we don't know that is because it's based on two things. First, how much the virus is going to change over time and if the vaccine loses efficacy against those strains. And second, how long it takes until the antibodies start to decrease in your body just in general. Um, and we don't know those things. We know that the the vaccine provides better protection than natural infection. Uh, we can say that it'll protect you at least six months and people say it's only six months. No, we can say that it's at least six months because we've been able to study it for six months and say you're still protected after six months. So after 12 months, we'll do another study after 18 months and so on and so forth. Um, it doesn't look like it wears off quickly. So an annual shot uh, probably will be unnecessary. That's my guess. But I wouldn't be surprised if we have to get it every two years, three years, five years, something like that. Like we get a tetanus shot every 10 years. It's going to depend on those two things that I mentioned. We just don't know the answer to those things yet. Um, so it, it's hard to say. I can see us needing booster shots down the road or something like that. The question is, how long will it be? And I don't think anybody really knows. But making it an annual thing um, doesn't seem like where we're going quite yet. Thank you. Um, I think it is now, well, it is now 501. Um, and I know that um, we have Phi Cap Phi induction ceremony. If anybody is planning on attending that, I don't want to keep anyone. So, Dean Usher, do you have any a final remark to um, I just, conclude I, this evening? I want to thank, I want to thank all of you. Uh, Dr. Leibus, it was such a pleasure. It was so fascinating uh, to hear what you had to say. It was generous of you to share your expertise with us. We're all very concerned, all of society, the, the global society is concerned about what happens next. And uh, you have um, just gone a long way uh, to answering our questions with wonderful factual information and with great humanity, if I may say. I want to thank Julie Johnson, Ashley Stone, and all the other people who helped us create this town hall today. And I have one more question to ask you. Would you be willing to come back again if, as the months go by, we feel that more questions come up? Because it has been a real privilege and a pleasure to have you today with us. I would be happy to come back again. As you can see behind me, I've had my drum set pretty much in every video chat that I've done for the last year. I think the only time it wasn't there is when I when I took down the old drum set and put up the new one. Um, and so, you know, I 
I want to see performances back. I want people to be able to get together and play music and perform. I, I miss the arts. I miss those things. And so I'm happy to do anything I can to help you get back to normal. So I'd be happy well, to come back again. You said that, I think it was in jest, but you said that I could become an honorary epidemiologist. So I'm going to say <laughs> you're now an honorary member of our college. And I think we welcome, <laughs> you. We welcome you warmly. I do have a I do have a thought about the people who didn't get a chance to ask their questions. If our wonderful facilitators could uh, could take down those questions and then uh, email them to you, um, and then when you get your when they get the answers back, to deliver them back to the people who who uh, formed those you know who created those questions. I would feel that we we we're doing going the extra mile so to speak to serve the people who are here in the audience because there are some really there were great questions that people asked and I even the ones that didn't get asked today I would still like to serve them and find a way for them to get their questions answered would that be okay with you sure either um if it's a just a couple of questions I'll do it by email if it's a bunch of questions I can just do a quick YouTube video and send a link and then you can just watch it that way and get through everything great. Because I don't want anyone to feel that they weren't served today if they had a. No, we just ran out of time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I think we'll say goodbye. And again, a huge thank you to you. And we look forward to speaking to you again in the future. But thank you so much. And thank you to Julie and Ashley and everyone else who helped make this happen. Thank you very much.